before we continue with Matthew chapter 11 today, let's back up a wee bit and reset the context. The first 19 verses of this chapter were about John the Baptist in relation to his connection with Christ. First, he was the foretold herald, the messenger, who prepared the way in the wilderness for the Lord. So, he fulfilled the role of Elijah. Second, he was not greater than Yeshua. In fact, Yeshua was John's Lord, just as much as He is for the rest of us. Therefore, John was lesser in rank than Jesus and was to obey and trust in Him. And finally, we find that John's and Christ's ministries ran along parallel tracks. Even though these tracks were connected at some points and, and separated at others. Now, we've already encountered this reality that John wasn't entirely certain of who Yeshua was, and that what John taught his disciples did not always agree with what Yeshua taught his. Then with verse 20, we entered a new phase. The twelve disciples have been taught, they've now been sent out to towns and villages throughout the Galilee region. Yeshua Himself has traveled mainly around the Galilee, currently He's doing it alone, teaching, doing miracles typical of a Jewish holy man, a Sadiq. He has explained that He is Daniel's Son of Man, and thus, to those who have open ears and minds, This firmly establishes Him as of divine connection, if not origin. So now the issue becomes the response to Him of those who've heard Him and witnessed these many miraculous healings that He's done. Now what we're going to see is that this response includes both that of individuals as well as that of communities. That is, it is one thing for an individual to put trust in Him, but that's not the end of it. There is also an expectation by Jesus that entire cities, regions, nations are to respond corporately as a community to who He is. Therefore, a person can come to trust Him and ultimately be saved, but can, at the same time, wind up as collateral damage if that person is attached to a community that corporately stands against Him. This greatly mirrors what we find in the Torah. We saw in the matter of Abraham entering into negotiations with God over the fate of the people of Sodom, mainly to the benefit of his nephew Lot, that individuals might be rescued on account of their faith, but they also may lose their lives if they choose to remain among communities that are condemned for their wickedness. So let's get our bearings by reading Matthew 11, starting at verse 19. Open your Bibles to Matthew 11, verse 19. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we'll begin on page 1236. That's 1, 2, 3, 6. Starting at verse 19, we'll go to the end. The Son of Man came, eating freely, drinking wine, so they say, aha, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, the proof of wisdom is in the actions it produces. Then Yeshua began to denounce the towns in which He had done most of His miracles, because the people had not turned from their sins to God. Oh, woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! 
Why, if the miracles done in you had been done in Sor and Sidon, they would have long ago put on sackcloth and ashes as evidence that they had changed their ways. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sor and Sidon than for you on the day of judgment. And for you, Kafar Nahum, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you'll be brought down to Sheol. For if the miracles done in you had been done in Sodom, it would still be in existence today. But I tell you that on the day of judgment it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom than for you. It was at that time that Yeshua said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you concealed these things from the sophisticated and educated and you revealed them to ordinary folks. Yes, Father, I thank you that it pleased you to do this. My Father has handed over everything to me. Indeed, no one fully knows the Son except the Father, and no one fully knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son wishes to reveal Him. Come to me, all of you who are struggling and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." The reason I wanted to begin our reading today at verse 19 is because of something we've discussed uh, a couple of times in earlier lessons. It is that Yeshua is depicted in the Gospel accounts, and especially in John's and in Matthew's, as the embodiment of wisdom. This is no small matter if we're going to properly understand the nature and the character of our Savior. See, the scriptural relationship between God and wisdom is central to the writings of the Bible. In Jewish literature of the day, wisdom was seen as feminine, even given the name Sophia. Thus, in the Jewish concept, divine wisdom was much more than an ideal. It had actual form. Yeshua was expressing, He is that form. So in verse 27, when Christ states, that only the Father knows the Son and only the Son knows the Father, a very intimate, closely tied relationship, we find this same kind of relationship in Jewish thought that only wisdom knows God. Now, while we find a great deal of attention uh, to the matter of wisdom outside the Bible, there is also much attention paid to it within the Holy Scriptures, only sometimes it seems vague to us. So I'd like to recite a passage in Job that is quite pertinent to what Jesus said. I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Job. Go to Job chapter 28. Job chapter 28. We're going to start reading at verse 12. So if you have a complete Jewish Bible, We're on page 1025. 1025. This is the book of Job, chapter 28. Follow along with me. We're going to read from 12 to 28. But where can wisdom be found? Where is the source of understanding? No one knows its value. It can't be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it isn't in me. The sea says, it isn't, it isn't with me. It can't be obtained with gold, nor can silver be weighed out to buy it. It can't be purchased with choice gold from Ophir, or with precious onyx or sapphires. Neither gold nor glass can be compared with it nor can it be exchanged for a bowl of fine gold, let alone coral or crystal. For indeed, the price of wisdom is above that of pearls. 
It can't be compared with Ethiopian topaz. It can't be valued with pure gold. So where does wisdom come from? Where is the source of understanding? Inasmuch as it is hidden from the eyes of all living and kept secret from the birds flying around in the sky. Destruction and death say, well, we've heard a rumor about it with our ears. God understands its way. He knows its place. For He can see to the ends of the earth and view everything under heaven. When He determined the force of the wind and parceled out water by measure, when He made a law for the rain and cleared a path for the thunderbolts, then He saw wisdom and declared it. Yes, He set it up, searched it out, and to human beings He said, Look, a fear of Adonai is wisdom, shunning evil is understanding. Therefore Job declares that wisdom is from God and its substance is of God. See, now this is not intended as an abstract or, an al- in, 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 or in the allegorical sense. Notice in verse 27 of Job uh, 28 how wisdom is characterized as a living entity having form. A truly fascinating expose about wisdom can be found in Ecclesiasticus. It's also known as the Wisdom of Sirach. This is one of the books of the Apocrypha that has been included in the Bible, usually as a separate section, just as the Old Testament and New Testament are seen as separate sections, but then removed, re-included, removed again, and then finally permanently banished from Protestant Bibles early in the 1800s. But it remains in the Catholic Bible, many Orthodox Christian Bibles, several of the lesser known branches of Christianity also retain it. Now never was it seen on the same level, the same high level of inspiration as the Old and New Testaments, not even in the first century among the Jews. However, the apocryphal books were seen as truthful, insightful, and worthy of being read and incorporated into a a God worshiper's life. So we shouldn't simply dismiss these works, and I recommend to all of you that you all acquire a book of the Apocrypha and you read it. Now, Before I recite to you a short passage from the Wisdom of Sirach, Ecclesiasticus. I need to explain a little more about this particular book and the Apocrypha in general. Perhaps the primary reason that the books of the Apocrypha were removed as a section of the Protestant Bible is because several of them were always considered as Jewish in flavor and tone. Too Jewish, in fact. So yes, anti-Semitism played a significant role for their exclusion. These books were written well before Christ was born. The Wisdom of Sirach, for instance, was written about 180 BC and in the Hebrew language. Soon it was translated into Greek and it spread throughout the Jewish diaspora. It was an exceedingly valued book within the Jewish culture even before Jesus came along and it continued to be all during His lifetime. The point is that we are going to see some phrases and some sayings of Yeshua that are similar to what we will find in the Apocrypha. And in other cases they are nearly word for word. Now this shouldn't alarm us, but it should pique our curiosity. These books, and especially the Wisdom of Sirach, were greatly valued and believed and taught, so Jesus of course knew them well. He wouldn't have had much disagreement with most of what these works have to say. As He was communicating with fellow Jews who were also familiar with these works, He would occasionally employ familiar terms and phrases that came from a 
came from these works. It's just a natural flow of conversation. The difficulty for us arises when we attempt to understand these terms and phrases taken from a work such as the Wisdom of Sirach, as used to describe wisdom in its source, for example, outside of the common Jewish cultural context of the first century, which is exactly what mainstream Christianity often attempts. Well, the result can be some rather unsound doctrines. Now, I'm going to read to you a short section from the Wisdom of Sirach, chapter 1, starting with verse 1. All wisdom comes from the Lord, and it remains with Him forever. The sand of the seas and the drops of rain and the days of eternity, who can count them? The height of the heavens and the breadth of the earth and the deep and wisdom, who can track them out? Wisdom was created before them all, and sound intelligence from eternity. Well, to whom has the source of wisdom been revealed? And who knows her devices? There is but one who was wise, a very terrible one, seated upon His throne. The Lord created her. He saw her and counted her, and He poured her out upon all He made, upon all mankind as He chose to bestow her. But He supplied her liberally to those who love Him. Now, this represents the rather general view of wisdom common throughout Jewish culture. So in Matthew 11, we have Jesus identifying Himself as the, that embodiment, that form of divinely created wisdom. This means that Yeshua has the knowledge to reveal hidden revelations that mankind cannot of ourselves simply know no matter how intently we seek it on our own. What Yeshua says agrees very closely to what Ben Sirach says, but in Yeshua's words we see another connection to yet another person from the past in Hebrew history, Moses. Now, From the beginning of our study in the Gospel of Matthew, I have pointed out that always in the background of what Matthew writes about Yeshua is Him being the literal embodiment of wisdom, but also that He is the prophet like me that Moses said would come. These sorts of things sound a little bit alien to the 21st century Gentile Christians. In fact, I, I think Gentile Christianity has from its earliest days struggled in dealing with this clear reality because of its inherent Jewishness. Therefore, we are meant to see that Moses and Yeshua are tightly linked. So we should look to the Torah to help us understand what Yeshua means by the many things that he says. For instance, when Yeshua speaks about the Father and Son knowing each other in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, it has a direct connection to Moses and God in Exodus 33, 12, and 13. I'm going to present this to you in the King James Version because it is a more literal translation from the Greek than is the complete Jewish Bible. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. Now, in the last couple of verses of Matthew 11, Yeshua speaks about his own meekness or gentleness and of his yoke. Now, meekness is one of the primary attributes 
that the Torah ascribes to Moses. And the term yoke, well that was a word regularly used among Jews to describe one's required connection to the Law of Moses. So while it's not readily apparent to the modern Gentile believer, ancient Jews would have picked up on the Yeshua-Moses connection. Now whether they accepted it or not, that's another matter. Obviously most didn't. Yeshua also speaks of giving rest, rest to the people who yoke themselves to Him. This again cements His link with Moses. In Exodus 33-14 God speaks to Moses and says, Set your mind at rest. My presence will go with you after all. Well, moving on in Matthew 11, verse 20, Yeshua speaks about the negative responses to His person and His message that He sees coming from several cities. Now, since any and every city or town is actually but a conglomerate of people who live there, then it would be unimaginable that every last person in a decent sized city or town would reject Jesus and His message. So when here we find Christ condemning these cities to destruction, it is on a corporate, not an individual level. That city as a whole is going to pay a steep price in the form of physical destruction that will potentially harm even the few, even the one, that has decided to trust in Him. Notice the reason for Christ's denunciation of these cities. It is that He's done many miracles there. He had healed many people, but this still did not bring that community to trust in Him. Now we discussed in earlier lessons that one of the great points made within Matthew's Gospel is that the workings of miracles does not lead to people trusting in Christ as it might seem that it ought to. Clearly Jesus thought it should have. And it made Him not just a little bit upset that it didn't. He didn't do miracles with the ulterior motive of cities and individuals trusting in Him. He did them because He had great compassion on the afflictions of the people. On the other hand, He expected that these many jaw-dropping miracles would have affected the people in a way that went beyond easing their physical suffering. He expected that they would have turned from their sins, that is, they would have repented in response to being healed. And, and the witnesses to these miracles would have been equally impressed. It didn't turn out that way. So in verse 21, Yeshua specifically calls out the cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida. Now, if you've been to Israel with me, You've probably been to both of those places. Both of these are located in the Upper Galilee, near to the Sea of Galilee. Chorazin's a couple miles north of Capernaum, that was Jesus' resident city for some time now, and Bethsaida is, is towards the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. However, its exact location is in dispute. There is a substantial academic debate over whether the ruins of Bethsaida are to be identified with um, the archaeological dig at uh, El Tel or El Araj. And both of these are on the northeastern side of the lake. Either way, these two cities are the targets of Yeshua's ire. He says that the thoroughly Gentile and thus pagan cities of Zor and Sidon, located in modern day Lebanon, would have been more accepting of Him than were the thoroughly Jewish cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida. Now, Zor and Sidon at one time were completely destroyed, but by Christ's day they had been rebuilt and they were thriving port cities on the Mediterranean. 
in Ezekiel chapter 28. Both Zor and Sidon are singled out for judgment, and no doubt this is why Christ chose them to use as an illustration. It appears that by the first century, the words like Zor and Sidon had more or less joined uh, the regularly used comment of like Sodom and Gomorrah as a way of speaking about warnings of judgment. Now Yeshua says that if He had done His miracle healings in those two cities, Gentile cities, they would have put on sackcloth and ashes. Well, the wearing of sackcloth and throwing of ashes over one's head was symbolic with mourning and repentance. Uh, usually the mourning is the result of the repentance. So the implication is that Zor and Sidon would have turned from their sinful paganism and accepted Yeshua because of all the miracles. Now it's difficult to accept this as a truly prophetic statement. That is, this doesn't seem to be that Yeshua is claiming to know from some kind of divine foreknowledge that he had that had he visited those two cities and performed miracles that they would have indeed repented. Rather, this more seems like the use of a standard phrase within Jewish culture of that era in order to make a very passionate point. So Yeshua as the accuser has set Chorazin and Bethsaida before the great judge as unrepentant sinners, and now comes the verdict. The verdict is that on Judgment Day, those two Jewish cities, meaning the community of people living there along with the buildings, are going to suffer more catastrophe and suffering than did Zor and Sidon did when they were destroyed, as promised by God. I want to pause and think about this for a moment. The Jewish residents of the two cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida, again, Jewish cities, no doubt thought of themselves as good and righteous worshipers of God, whereas Zor and Sidon never thought of themselves as worshipers of God. And yet because Chorazin and Bethsaida didn't repent from their sins and accept Yeshua, they're going to be judged more harshly than those two pagan cities will. Why? Because the residents of those two Jewish cities had been steeped in the Hebrew religion. They had every advantage. Their entire heritage was based on knowing Yahweh, the God of Israel. They had the Law of Moses. They had the Torah. They had the Prophets. It's not that they thought they had become wicked and sinners, but in Jesus' eyes, by rejecting Him, they were wicked. And they were also rejecting their true religion and their God, the Father. I want to say this a little differently. As a result of their sin and blindness to it, it led to the Jewish people of Chorazin and Bethsaida rejecting their Messiah. Today there's this dangerous doctrine called the Dual Covenant. It's been around for a while. And lately it's been championed by several pastors who clearly love Israel and the Jewish people. And they love them so much that they cannot emotionally stand the idea that Jews would be destined for the lake of fire if they didn't accept Jesus as their Messiah. So. The Dual Covenant doctrine states that Jews believing in the Father is sufficient for salvation for them. Now look, I love Israel. I love the Jewish people as well. But I love them so much, I am not about to tell them something that is false. Even if it's offensive to them, especially because it affects uh, relationships with their God and involves their eternity. 
This section of Matthew makes it clear that trust in Yeshua is what saves a person, Jew or Gentile, from judgment. Believing in God is not enough. Being of Jewish heritage, it's not enough. Yeshua shows us that if we truly trust God and the way God counts it as our trust, then we'll trust His Son. All else is lip service and it destines us to a dark future. You see, the major turnoff for Jews is not that they don't want to trust in a Messiah. It's that they don't want to trust in the Gentile version of a Messiah that marginalizes his own Jewishness and discards God's love for his people and nation, Israel. The Crusades and the Inquisition happened many centuries ago, but the victims of the church's unconscionable actions were primarily Jews. And it is well remembered within modern Jewish society. For young people today, it may seem that 75 years ago that the Holocaust has happened is just dusty ancient history. Yet it's not such a long time ago. And a few people who were victims of it are still alive today to remind us of it. The point is, I don't blame the Jews one bit for not wanting to hear about a Western Romanized Christianity, nor of a Eastern Orthodox Christianity that has a history of being just as hateful towards the Jews, and also that sees Jews as just thrown aside and forgotten by God. So the answer from Christianity should not be to present Jews with the false hope of dual covenants for salvation, one for Jews, another for Gentiles, one that requires trust in Messiah Yeshua, the other one that doesn't. The approach only makes the church feel better, perhaps applies a little balm to our collective guilt. Or maybe it makes us think we can get that gospel message monkey off our back <laughs> so we don't have to evangelize Jews and suffer their rejection. The only answer is for the church to truly love the Jewish people with the truth and with mercy and with respect. And for the millions of members of the church to don sackcloth and ashes and acknowledge our wrongdoing and make a meaningful change. But this will not happen until a lot of unsound church doctrine is addressed head on and hopefully relegated to a shameful past. And this is not going to happen from the top down by trying to retrain the executive level of various denominations. It's only going to happen from the bottom up by teaching one willing but ordinary believer at a time, just as Christ did it. Now, as we've discussed in earlier lessons, Yeshua did not arrive with banners screaming, Your wait is over, your Messiah is here. And I am He. Rather, since the Jewish people's acceptance of Him would necessarily require repentance by people who already believed in the God of the Bible, thought they were in good stead with Him, Christ had to address some of the wrong doctrines, misguided traditions that had sent them careening off course before they were able to hear and understand the truth of who He is and was. I maintain that the present church is, in general, little different and has been in a similar boat as those Jews for at least 1,700 years. Allow me to offend you a little bit more. The 
The Jesus, as is usually portrayed by the mainstream church, is not the historical biblical Jesus. Rather, he's some kind of a contrived caricature that satisfies, satisfies the need to have him fit with predetermined doctrines and various Gentile cultural views. Can that save anyone? No matter how genuinely sincere or what nice people they are? No matter how much they raise their hands and call on this non historical Jesus' name? I mean, I would imagine that it's not a one size fits all answer, and I have no ability to separate the sheep from the goats, so to speak. But I want to remind you of what I deem to be the most terrifying words in the Bible. Because I think they were spoken just for this scenario. Matthew 7, 21-23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? I'm going to tell them to their faces. I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Notice that the issue is not about whether a person knows or worships the God of Israel. See, that's taken as a given in this passage. He's not talking to pagans or people who think they're pagans. Rather, the issue is knowing and worshiping Yeshua as God's Son, not a made up Jesus, the real Jesus, the real New Testament Jesus. And it also involves our obeying Him in the context of what He instructed. Not in some modern spin that allows us to avoid what he clearly said and expects of us. I mean, how could hundreds, even thousands of Jewish people in Judea and the Galilee personally witness his amazing miracles and hear his incomparable words directly from his own mouth and say, no thanks? Because if you are ready, you already believe, you are certain that you are righteous, if you are certain you think you know the truth, you are not open to being corrected. Nor are you open to having what you believe challenged and being forced to defend it with actual scriptural truth. Now, I am not nearly as concerned for the, the pagans who know they are not saved. I'm far more concerned for those who are certain they are saved, but in reality, they don't know their Savior. They don't have any idea of their obligations or their duties to Him and to His Father because they rely on traditions and caricatures and not biblical truth. This is precisely what happened to the good people of Chorazin and Bethsaida. Now in verse 23, it continues to startle. Yeshua condemns his own home city of Capernaum. Similarly, many, many of his miracles that we've read about were done in Capernaum. Some of his most spectacular, some of his most meaningful. And yet, even those residents refused to repent from their sins and trust in him. Now, I think it's fair to ask at this point exactly what the Jews were to trust Christ as. That is, it is correctly said that these Jews were to trust in Him, but exactly what was it they were supposed to trust? Even John the Baptist was struggling with this issue. Are you the ones to come or should we look for someone else? See, to date, 
to this point in Matthew, the message that the twelve disciples were sent out with was only that the kingdom of heaven has, had arrived. It was not that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, because He had not directly said so, and the subject hadn't even been broached. So between His miracles and His teaching, Yeshua's point was not yet that the people should trust in Him as their Messiah, but rather that they should trust in Him enough to learn through His authoritative instructions that they are sinners. They are not righteous before God as they think they are. They need to repent. There is a larger point to be made here. Folks, if we don't accept Yeshua and then repent, you see, because first, first we repent, then we accept Yeshua. That's the order of things. If we don't feel any deep urging to confess and to confront the fact that we are sinners in God's eyes, and then we sincerely repent from our sinning, then why would we think we need a Savior? See, in verse 23, by Yeshua asking the rhetorical question about if Capernaum would be exalted to heaven, it means would the city and the inhabitants of Capernaum be held up to God and presented as innocent on Judgment Day? Yeshua says, no way to that. But they are certainly going to be brought down to Sheol. Now, actually, the Greek says they'll be brought down to Hades. Now, you can look up the terms Sheol and Hades on the Torah class website to get some in depth understanding of them. But for our purpose today, know that to Jews and even to Greeks of that day, Hades is, was not the equivalent of Christian hell. But neither was it in the complete Jewish translation of Sheol. Because Sheol for the Jews was simply the grave. The grave. And since Yeshua is speaking to Jews, he meant Sheol, the grave, the place where the dead are buried. So, to be clear, even though we indeed find in the Greek manuscripts the word Hades, it's because this was the way they translated. Sheol. Now remember, Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. So what we read in Matthew is a Greek translation that's been translated now to English. And it's not the best translation. For the Greeks, you see, Hades was the netherworld. It was the pagan realm of the dead. With some people living quite comfortably, others not so much. There were cities and servants. There was food, there was parties, there was orgies. Pretty much everything available to the living, living only better. The Jews had no such concept of this. The bottom line is that Yeshua says that Capernaum is not only not going to be exalted, they are in for a catastrophic fall. Yeshua resurrects the old usage of Sodom as an object lesson for the wicked by saying that what happens to Capernaum is going to be worse than what happened to Sodom. Now, I don't know how much worse it could be. Sodom never recovered from God's judgment on them. Well, the next verse has a couple of parts to it. Verse 25 is essentially a prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving that Yeshua speaks publicly so that the crowd can hear it and learn from it. It extols the Father as the true Lord of heaven and earth. So while as believers we can speak of Christ as Lord of heaven and earth in one sense, we must always understand it from the perspective of seeing Christ as the Father's agent. The Father didn't die. He didn't retire and turn the family business over to His Son. 
Christ continually receives His power and authority from the Father in order that it would be used to continually carry out the Father's will. And Yeshua emphasizes this at every opportunity. Now, it's interesting that the phrase, Lord of heaven and earth, only occurs three times in the entire New Testament. Each time it is meant for the readers to recall God the Father creating the universe from Genesis 1 1. Now, the second part of verse 25 that had that God has hidden these things from the the wise and the educated, but made them known to the simple. I imagine your version of the Bible will say something different but but similar because I'm trying to condense all the different translation possibilities into one. First, what are these things that God has hidden from the wise and the educated? There's many different theological opinions on the statement. Now, from the general sense, it had to be whatever it was that Jesus was revealing. What he was revealing was an awareness of just where Israel and the Jewish people stood at that moment in history. More specifically, it was a revelation of awareness of what comes with the latter days. Now, as we've discussed on many occasions, the Jews at that time believed they had entered the end times. They were wrong about that, but indeed they had been experiencing the latter days. See, Christians tend to make the latter days and the end times as synonymous terms, yet clearly they are not. Because in the New Testament we find two latter days, but only one in times. The term in times means exactly what it says, the end. There will be no more human history as we know it after that. However, after the first of the two latter days, history will, and of course it did, continue. Both latter days require an appearance of the Messiah, His advent, then His return. And this is what confused the Jews the most as concerned Jesus because they didn't see two appearances of the Messiah in their theology. Although, interestingly, we do find later rabbis suggesting it. Now, second, another part of this verse concerns who exactly is having the revelation hidden from them and who is being allowed to receive it. The question has to be coupled with, why would the Father want this revelation hidden from anyone, let alone wise and understanding people? What's wrong with being wise? I mean, I I thought that's what we're supposed to be as God worshipers. Well, we find the following in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. Therefore, I will keep shocking these people with astounding and amazing things until their wisdom of their wise ones vanishes, and the discernment of their discerning ones is hidden away. And in 1 Corinthians 1.19, indeed, the Tanakh says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and frustrate the intelligence of the intelligent. See, the term wise and understanding, or wise and intelligent, or wise and prudent, whatever's in your Bible, had become among first century Judaism a negative expression. It is sarcastic in tone because it refers to people, sometimes secular, who are enamored and puffed up by their own intelligence and are certain of having unassailable wisdom. They're a legend in their own mind. But in reality, as for correct knowledge of God, they have little or none. So, 
who were those to whom revelations were revealed? And again, we find a variety of translations from the Greek to the English. These people are babes, or they are children, or they are childlike, or they are simple. They are as a complete Jewish Bible has it, ordinary folks. The Greek word being translated into all these different English words is nepoi. It, in certain usages it means infants, but the idea as it is used here is that it represents people who are the opposite of the wise and learned. So are we to assume that Yeshua doesn't much like intelligent people? Or people that are educated. No, that's not what's happening. We have to put our first century Jewish mindsets on to get it. The term the wise and the learned is a direct shot at the Pharisees and the scribes, and it just drips with sarcasm. It probably includes the heads of the Jewish religious academies, the most renowned among them located in Jerusalem, just like the one Paul attended. This is a negative characterization of the arrogant synagogue and Jewish academic leadership that boasts of their personal wisdom and knowledge that is anything but God-inspired. Did you know that in some of the tractates of the Talmud, you actually have God coming down to earth to get the wisdom of rabbis? Is that not the height of arrogance? All during His ministry on earth, Yeshua had a running battle with the Jewish religious elite and the Pharisees. They never failed (laughs) to question His doctrine and He never failed to denounce theirs. The babes, on the other hand, represent the opposite. They were those common Jews who, in the opinion of the religious Jewish authorities, are weak and simple. But in God's economy, they were His elect. See, it's embedded in Jewish literature of that time and later that God's revelation is not there for everyone to share. There is this underlying criteria that God uses to determine who among His created humanity receives such divine revelation. We we can find this thought in the book of Job, Job 28, 28. We've already read it. And to human beings He said, look, fear of Adonai is wisdom. Shunning evil, this is understanding. So the criteria is those who are wholehearted and prepared themselves humbly to receive God's revelations by fearing Him will gain wisdom by means of obeying Him. The moral, obedient, and meek will be given such knowledge. But those who see God's revelations as but mere literary or human-based knowledge to be obtained or perhaps as something that, that, that should be measured against secular standards, they're going to be denied. I, mean, I, I, I want to editorialize a little bit to give you a practical, but I think shocking, example of this for the 21st century because I want you to be aware. There are several modern era Bible commentators that do not believe in Christ, and they claim no belief at all in God. But these are Bible commentators. And if they do believe in God, it's not necessarily the God of the Bible, but perhaps of some undefined non-earthly intelligence or a mix of attributes of God's various religions, so as not to appear bigoted, but rather fair-minded. It's in vogue today at many Christian colleges to add an Islamic studies department because they either see no conflict between that and the Christian faith 
Or there is an intellectual argument to be made for believers to learn all about Islam so as to promote more diversity and tolerance and understanding, if not acceptance, of a faith that they see as having a common heritage to ours. Some of this particular strand of popular Bible commentators and professors and their colleagues believe in a kind of spiritualism, but not in spirit. Others don't accept the spiritual whatsoever. This is actually not even a 21st century phenomenon. It began among the European Bible commentators of the early 19th century because of the rise of European enlightenment that tars and feathers anyone believing in God as a primitive, ignorant person who trusts superstition instead of science and reason and in so doing impedes mankind's social and intellectual progress. So many Bible commentators today operate out of secular universities and they long to be respected by their peers. And so many decades, for many decades now, Christianity has become relegated to the status of but one of many human philosophies. And the Bible is just a specific kind of ancient Jewish literature and myth that's no different than any other ancient literature and myth except it's entirely religious in nature. Therefore, the Bible is perceived that way. It's read that way. It's interpreted that way. And it's taught that way to their young, eager students. And as hard as it might be to believe, folks, much of the teaching material used in modern seminaries and even in Christian theological schools comes from that particular strand of commentators because their approach has gained such popular appeal today. Now I tell you this, not only as a caution but also as an object lesson, because these particular scholars and commentators that I'm describing are indeed intelligent. They're well educated and they're probably decent people who are at the same time the prime examples of what Jesus is speaking about, speaking against in Matthew 11, 25. They are though who, those who Job warns us about. They are also what Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians, and he ought to know, having gone to one of the elite Jewish religious academies. Some of the most respected Bible commentators of our era believe rightly that the academic preparation and criteria for being able to properly understand the words of the Bible so as to be able to teach others about it is scholarly expertise in the original languages or literary knowledge of the Bible era or being a historian of the historian of the ancient Near and Middle East or all of the above. Now these are all good and useful, and I happen to think indispensable disciplines for learning and teaching God's Word. But, <laughs> tragically, what they leave out, what they don't understand, is that the doors to true wisdom and authentic divine knowledge and revelation are closed to them because they do not know or trust God. Without that trust, they are operating and teaching only within their own limited human understanding and intellect and wisdom. See, This is an explosive mixture that makes them just as dangerous for the God-seekers of today as it was when many of the Pharisees and scribes use their human-centered thought to instruct the Jews who sought God in Yeshua's era. Yeshua aptly described them earlier in Matthew as wolves in sheep's clothing. We'll continue in Matthew chapter 11 next week.